think outside the box, if you will. I mean, go there, go off campus. Let's think this through. And sure enough, that's where the Mustang was born. When it finally hit, it took the country by storm. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Cars in Context. I'm your host, John Clore. This is the Motor City, and this is the show where we put cars into the context of your everyday life. Today, we've got a fun topic, one that I think the kids are going to really enjoy because they're part of the problem we're having with our car loving and car driving world. And the problem is that they don't have the love that we have of the automobile. And so we're going to ask one of our favorite uh, show stoppers that we've ever had on Cars and Context, none other than Jim Sawyer. Jim, welcome to Cars and Context. Jim John, is thank from you. the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, longtime auto journalist, always been my managing editor pretty much throughout my entire journalism career. And Jim, a very guiding soul there. And I'm going to ask you to guide us through this one because this topic about why young people don't seem to have the affection for cars, uh, it just it boggles my mind. I don't understand it. I want, I want people to know that maybe, if, if it's possible, America's love affair with the car could be over with this new generation. We'll discuss that in a minute. But before we do that, Jim, we should find out what's in the news. Okay, Jim, I'm going to take this first one. The question is now becoming, is being green passe? Is it not really cool anymore to be going green? I'm not talking about liking Kermit, okay? I mean Kermit the Frog, not Kermit Potter, our, our station superstar here at WMTV. Being green is, is something that's really been on the, the forefront of the auto industry for the last 10 years. But now, with the idea of alternative fuel vehicles, electrics, and plug-ins, there are people that are saying it's really now being challenged. This Consumer Federation of America is saying, yes, it's still really cool because well, they said, well, then why are electric selling better and plug-in hybrids? Okay, that's a, good, that's a good point. But a company called Phoenix Marketing International, I don't know if I've heard of them before, they says that the, they, the public interest is actually declining in being green. And they actually report that 31% of U.S. car buyers say they want green cars, but that's actually down from 35% just a year ago. And they say the reason is they don't really feel that they really need a green car anymore. Uh, gas prices are going down a little bit. Yep. Uh, the economy in the U.S. is improving a little bit. They miss performance. They, they hate to the drive around in a car. And that's maybe just because the fuel economy of gasoline-powered cars is going up. Yeah, and then they said... They, they, the, the electric cars and some of these uh, hybrids uh, don't have the pizzazz, and that's just not the right. same feeling, which goes back to our topic today, Jim. You know, the love affair with your car right. is, is the, are these uh, appliances that well, we Well, we'll find out more about this when we start seeing if people buy a second or a third electrified car. Yeah, when they've tried the green machine, and now they come right. back, and now they go get an 800 horsepower right. rocket. Yeah, okay. Why don't you take a headline, Jim? Well, there are other types of electronic cars. Okay. I bet you didn't know that. They're called autonomous <laughs> cars. They drive themselves. They get on the freeway. Oh, they I stop. They brake. These. They park. You've seen some of the commercials. <sighs> the cars have options that will put you in a parking space. These take all the work out of your hands and put them in the hands of the computer. I hate And these. Nissan, Nissan wants to be first on the market in 2020 with a fully autonomous car. 2020? Stunning, yes. Now, most experts say 2025. Google, which is also oh. working on its own, says they're going to do it by 2017. <laughs> yeah. Now, Nissan has worked with some really big names on this. MIT, wow. Stanford, Oxford University really? in Great Britain, Carnegie Mellon, wow. University of Tokyo, and they want to fast track this to the point where they're even building a proving ground in Japan. For self-driving cars? For self-driving cars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stay off that track. But there are We're tests, already doing it. Yeah, your there brother, are tests, your there brother are tests told underway us. in this country, yeah. Nevada, Florida, California, yeah. where autonomous cars, which have really big, funny-looking like satellite eyeballs, yeah. type things on, yeah. on the roof, are driving around with somebody just sitting there eating their lunch. or It's, it's a great way to text and be safe, I guess. Yeah, there you go, um, text and drive. And part of the reason for doing this is to uh, 
avoid traffic jams, make driving yeah. more efficient. We'll have to see. It, right now we have lane departure warning, self-parking. We got those things. But will people really trust I, I, I would be the too car nervous. entirely over? I'd be way too nervous, Jim, to, to, to actually get in one of these cars and not touch the steering wheel and just uh, assume it's going to make all the right moves. I mean, I, I'm nervous when any member of my family is driving and I'm in the passenger seat. <laughs> and they, I can't do it. I can't do it. Uh, we'll have to see. I'm, the jury's out on this one. Right. I'm going to wait, Jim. Uh, Only seven more years till 2020. Google, I'll uh, have to Google it then. But I'm not in favor of, if you really don't want to drive, please just get on the bus, take the train, call a friend, don't drive. That, that's fine. But, but the, the self-driving car, not for me. Sorry. Well, speaking of cars that drive, and you can drive, here is an issue which I think has been coming up. And uh, it's because, you know, the big downturn in Detroit, all our factories were closed. A lot of factories across the U.S. closed Ford, General Motors, Chrysler. They all closed plants and uh, downsized themselves. Well, now cars are selling again. So we don't have as many factories. So what happens? Well, the factories got to go to a second shift, a third shift. Some of U.S. plants from the domestic automakers are running at 110, 130 percent of capacity. Now, what's the problem with that? It's highly profitable. The, you're, you, you're using all of your resources properly instead of uh, having wasted resources. Here's the problem. The Japanese never would allow this to happen because they said when you run your factory flat out and you run your employees three shifts, 24-7, nonstop, what suffers? Quality. So, Jim, right. I was just looking at the studies and I thought, you know what? To me, it makes sense. It's human nature. Do you find that to be the case? It makes sense to not run them 100% or it makes sense to make, do it? It makes sense not to just, people can't go flat out all day, right. all the, the shifts. I've, I've worked in auto plants and I've been in situations like this and it's nerve wracking yeah, where the, you're, the you're sitting there with a, essentially a repetitive action hour after hour, day after day for weeks on end. Um, but there's another reason not to do it and it's economic. What was that? Supply and demand. The fewer cars you make to meet demand means the higher price you can charge for them. The less incentive yeah, you that will be required. Sale. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Get... So it might be wise not to just keep churning them out. Yeah, not a good idea. And, I, and, and, folks, and eventually you'll oversell the market, and then you'll have to lay people off anyway. So smooth that curve i think i think as we are if car sales uh, stay the way they are you have 16 million a year uh maybe it'll time be maybe a good uh, res result would be to open a new factory and get hire more workers rather than just running the ones you have you know three shifts they take years to build those so yeah, that's, it does. that's part of the, yeah. the problem too yeah see what's a good problem to have we we're, right <laughs> yes i want you to give us another headline okay uh last year chrysler to great acclaim debuted a new viper oh yeah sports car wow Gorgeous. Monster. High performance. And, and one sorely missed because it had been out of production for a few years. However, the Detroit Free Press reported recently uh, that Chrysler is going to reduce production of the SRT Viper because sales are not what they expect. But wait a minute. It's, it's faster. It's better looking. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and everybody's buying these high performance cars. The new Corvette is out. Why, why, why are the sales? What happened to this? 5%? Well, the price went up substantially. What's it, substantially? It like 5, went from uh, the low 80s, about $83,000, to $100,000 wow. more. Wow, that's, that's, that's a price you know, job. Yeah, so sticker shock? A little sticker shock there. Um, so they build them up on the Mack Avenue plan, and they're going to get rid of right. that? They're not going to get rid of the employees. They've, uh, they've reduced the rate of production okay. by about one-third. Slow them down. So they do have excess staff there, but rather than lay them off, they're going to reassign them to other factories, hopefully to uh, give some relief to all these people working overtime <laughs> at those factories. Well, that's a good idea, Chrysler. Kudos to you. You know, I wish Ford would have kept building the Ford GT supercar, even if they only sold a couple hundred every year. It's just those kinds of cars right. are neither wonderful. And cars. again, the fewer you sell, the more valuable they are. So make production meet yeah, demand, there you go. <laughs> and you have happy customers and happy shareholders. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I've got one, and it's talking about supercars, talking about exciting news, folks. I'm going to break this to you here. This is probably the most exciting headline we've had on Cars and Context in a long time. Are you ready for this? I'm going to tell you about a Stingray, a brand new Corvette Stingray that you can afford with probably the money you have. In Do I put on my shock face now? Shock, yeah, give me a shock. That's it. Thank you. 
Would you believe it if I said you could buy a brand new 2014 Corvette Stingray for just under 300 bucks? This isn't the old one, that the old joke about the guy who died in it and they can't get this. <laughs> oh, no. no. No, I'm serious. I'm not making this up, folks. You can buy a brand new 2014 Corvette Legal, Stingray. Legal, legitimate. Le completely. In fact, you can do it today. I'll send Jeremy out and Kermit to go buy a couple stingers and bring them back here for just go break your piggy bank, 300 bucks, a little less than, because it's the price of the new Power Wheel Stingray model that's over at Toys R Us. Oh. Yeah, a brand new, it's a Fisher Price making it. It's the new 2014 Stingray. It's powered by a 12 volt electric drive line. This little 12 oh, volt. Another Corvette, sale of an electric it's car. It's an electric Great. car. Yeah, there we go. This little Stingray will go up to a top speed of six miles an hour in just under four seconds. It's a rocket ship. So look for the new Power Wheel Stingray at your favorite toy store just in time for Christmas. Now I've got to tell my I son and daughter-in-law <laughs> to hurry up and have grandchildren. Well, well anyway. you know, I just wish I would be able to fit in one of those because I would not be above driving up and down my street in, a, in this little Stingray, except the people would call and then it's just going to get more viewers watching Cars in Context, that crazy guy's out there driving a Power Wheel <laughs> Stingray. So get that car for Christmas, folks, and then, you know, put it in your garage. It's like the pedal cars. Back in the 50s, now right. the 60s, now those are things that are highly collectible. Who knows? So, anyway, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about is America's love affair with the car over? And then you millennials, I'm talking to you. We'll talk about this with Jim right after this brief message. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Cars and Context. I'm your host, John Clore. We're talking today with Jim Sawyer of the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, a longtime journalist and analyst. Jim, uh, when you were writing for Auto Week magazine, we used to tease each other about uh, the people, the car haters. Who are the car haters? Our publisher always had asked us to go out and find the car haters. What's right. wrong with people? How can you not like cars? Yeah, the cars have given us so much freedom and independence. Jim, in all your years of journalism, uh, I really don't think we've seen anything like what's going on today. And the question we're going to try to answer for you right now, folks, is America's love affair with the car over? Because you've been reading the headlines about millennials who look at cars as a transportation device. They get them from point A to point B. It's an appliance. They're more interested in tweets and cell phones and, and tablets than they are having a really cool car. So, Jim, let's go back to the beginning. Um, what really, I mean, when Henry Ford, we were just recently celebrating 100 years of the moving assembly line, which got cars out of the rich and gave it to every man, what was the big phenomenon? That Why did we all get that crazed button when we could buy our first car? Freedom. Freedom. Cars gave us freedom. We were free to go where we wanted, when we wanted, at a price essentially that we could afford. Gasoline was cheap, yep. 10, 20 cents a gallon. The car, Model T eventually got down to about $260 wow. for a brand new one. Wow. Now, it didn't have seat belts, airbags, air conditioning, <laughs> AM, <laughs> FM, radio. It didn't have all that stuff. Uh, but it was affordable right. for the wage of the day. Right. And it, it was great. We, we loved the freedom of doing it. Today, roads are crowded, cars are expensive relatively, gas, price of gas is high. And for the millennials, oh, they are kids. a generation that grew up with built-in chauffeurs. Yeah, that's they true. They didn't need a car. So, and, so, and something else, John. When they, if they did get a car, they didn't have to earn it. Mom, and I did this with my kids. I bought them cars. Mm. They didn't have to work after school so, on the weekends. So let's let's go back. Okay, so we started out. We 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 got these cars because we lived in a rural America. And we we were born on the farm. You had right. a horse. You could go into ago. town yeah. with your horse, and uh, or you could take a date. Whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
So you could go to town and sell your wares, as they said. And then that was it. You were born there. You, you worked there, the soil, and you died there, and you're buried behind the church. And, and your life was nothing big beyond 30 miles. The Model T comes along. We could drive on all over the place, and we had... You know, mostly in the cities, you saw these traffic jams and right. all these. We, but then all of a sudden, we decided, well, we need roads. Detroit and, and Michigan, all we had was dirt and mud paths, right. where, you know, wagon trails. So we started building all these wonderful roads. And first then we, mile of paved road was between six and seven mile in Detroit. In Detroit. One of the Highland first. Park, actually. I well, think. but I mean, you know, so we decided the, the roads, we started building these highways. We passed the Interstate Highway Act. And then Jim. Uh, after the war, our dads got back from the war, and we the, the lure of the open row where you look down a two-lane blacktop, and all you see was wide open spaces. You get in your hot, big, cool American car, and you got me a Chrysler. It's as big as a whale. It's about to set sail, and there you go, flying down the road. What is your we we wind is in your hair? Your convertible tops down on your hot rod. What is cooler and more, the, the, the feeling of freedom, what could be better than that? What happened? Why were we so enamored when you were, what, 15? You probably had your license when you were 11. <laughs> no, I just pushed the car down the driveway. And, <laughs> I started my car. Uh, took off. I was 12 and I was driving up and down the driveway waiting for... Because cars were not common. Right. Everybody didn't have... Families had one, one car. car. They didn't have to... We have... Three cars. Wow. Well, actually four, including my Lincoln. Uh, I've got my car. My wife's got her car. My daughter's got her car. And that's just in our household. My son's married, lives in D.C. He's got a car. His wife's oh, got a car. See, back then, so, right, because the, 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 the man would go to work, and June Cleaver would stay at home with the kids, and he'd take the car to work, so there was no car. But then after a while, when women got into the workforce, they needed to take the kids to school. Hey, I need a car, which is why... Uh, something like a, uh, the pony car, Mustang, something that didn't have to carry the whole family, something more sporty. Right. Why we had second cars, and they didn't have to be any everything like a station wagon. Dad took the station wagon to work, and we took it with the family. And, and instead of living in a rural area, right. we were still dispersed in suburbia. Right. So you had to drive to get places. So the car, then, then we had cars for us. When we became 16, 17, we didn't want to drive. I didn't want to drive my mom's car. Not, not that I didn't, not that I didn't like my mom. She was wonderful. Or my dad, but I didn't want my, my dad's car. I wanted my own car. Right. My own expression of who I was, and I've told this story many times, I wanted uh, in 1970, I, my dad was a Detroit police officer. My brother, a Woodward Street racer. Ugh, bad for me. Uh, so I talked. I went to Wayne State, saved a thousand dollars. I went into the showroom with a thousand dollars. I needed my dad to co-sign a loan. Dad, there's a car I want. I mean, he was looking at a red, 1970 Mustang Mach One with black racing stripes, shaker hood, window slats, Magnum 500s, four speed on the floor. And he said, "Son, why do you want that car?" He was a cop. How do you lie to a cop? Why do I want that car, Dad? Well, uh, well, it's uh, so I lied. I said, well, it's red, and it, it's got a four-speed. So he signed on the dotted line for that loan for that red four-speed Pinto. And that's how I got a Pinto. So I did not get but eventually I was able to get the cars I wanted. Right. And we, we, the cars were an outward expression of ourselves. But for today's millennials, they're seeing life in a different, they see traffic jams. They see the typical cars smashed on the highway. I got to get to soccer practice, mom, step on it. Why? And they're stuck in traffic. I don't like traffic, mom. Get me, or, you know, I got to get a bum a ride with my buddy, his buddy's Honda Accord, fit five of them in the back seat, and they, they, there's, you can't find room between them and all the McDonald's bags back there. There's no pride in my ride. They were just using the car as a means to get someplace. Right. And they saw traffic. Uh, they saw the, the use of uh, resources like steel and rubber as bad for the world. They saw the automobile as something horrific for the planet and they, they saw smog. What happened to their idea of freedom? Yeah, we gave up metals and glass and rubber and space in the highway but, and some smog, but our lives fundamentally changed. Jim, I can go and do what I want. It's part of being an American. What happened to them? Maybe because we have had that freedom, we don't value it so much. Mm. Cars have become a commodity. Everyone has one. What haven't people had? Cell phones, cell phone, you know, cell phones are cool. But ask yourself this. When you were 
9, 10, 11 years old. Did you have a car? That was the cool icon, physical object of society. I, I had a model car. But I you wanted, didn't have a real car. No, I wanted to. But a kid today, 9, 10, 11 years old, probably has a cell phone. I know. And it's probably cooler than the cell phone their parents have. <laughs> You mean your kid's smartphone, the i5, is better than your mom's flip phone? Probably so. And they've got a better data plan. Yeah. Not only and, that. And the kids, and that's what the kids have decided, yeah. whether on their own or the influences of marketing, have decided that's cool. And you see all these studies that say kids would rather have a smartphone and access to the internet than a car. Well, let's let's look at the validity of that question. Okay. Um, you buy a cell phone without a plan, and it's five six hundred bucks. You buy a car, brand new car, um, it's probably somewhere thirteen fourteen thousand dollars for the cheapest car in the market. At least. Yeah, okay. Yeah, at least. And then sixteen to twenty five right. if they're so. And, and what, so what, kids are saying, I can afford this. I can't afford that. Right. It's unobtainium. But at some point, wow. they're going to have the phone but they're still gonna need a car. <laughs> That's true. All right, so I've, I've had this discussion. I, this really bothers me, folks, that, that uh, our younger, our children are not enjoying the freedom of mobility and uh, the outward expression that the automobile gives you and, and how it's just an integral part of being an American. Uh, and I've talked to my millennial sons and they say to me, it's really, they don't think it's because they don't want something cool, you know? Uh, they would love to have the best, hottest, coolest thing out there, and then that, that's fine with them. Of course, they live in the same house that I am, so they're kind of influenced about, you know, they, I hope they watch Cars in Context every week. But they said the other thing about it is it's the economy, stupid. They can't afford it. First of all, they got $100,000 worth of student debt because they used to say, Dad, I want to go to this college. And I said, hey, two words, student loans. You know, I'm spending my year inheritance. So they, they said you get a job, you go to college, you get a degree, you come out of college, what do you got? A $35,000 part-time job, nobody's hiring, the economy's in the tank, you got debt, you, you can't even afford a, a, a decent apartment uh, with, with cable bills and all the other bills that, that right. we didn't have, all the other electronics you have to buy, and the pl they, their coffee at Starbucks is $7. They can't afford that lifestyle, so what do they, I call them the boomerang generation, they moved away and then now they're moving back in. So right. now they're in my basement and they, they are, they, where, when You're is there paying being? for the cable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not yeah. them. Yeah, so, but, so. But there's been a whole menu of wants that have competed with the car. With the car. Yeah. Not, I won't say needs because there are only certain basic needs to keep you alive, but the wants. Yeah. So, folks, when you hear these stories about millennials don't care about cars, they, they hate them. You'll be seeing, I'm going to mark my words, and we'll come back to the show later, uh, and, and say, geez, that guy was a clairvoyant. There is going to be a time when the millennials will get into the market, and they will buy nice cars because they, you know, they're so de deprived of that wonderful joy that we have right now. It may not be right now because the economic situation for people entering the job market is not good. But as we retire and boomers retire and we wind up all in the health care system, and we're all under Obamacare, we're, 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 they're going to have all the money. Right well, now, we have all the money. And they'll have so, room on the roads right, because we'll, we won't we'll be, be in there. The nursing we'll home. be in the ambulance. <laughs> That's it. Oh my so. God. So, so, let's, so we put the kibosh on this whole idea. It's not that they don't like I mean, a lot of it is, yeah, do I have to go over to my buddy's house after work? No, because you can just go to Facebook and see, hey, what's up? Sup. You know, but now... You're going to find that human interaction is going to be part of their lives, a greater part of their lives soon. So, folks, I hope that solves it for you. I know that it's been always been an issue for me. But, Jim, thank you again for shedding some light on that. John, you're quite welcome. But, well. you know, let's, let's come to another part of the, the show, which I really like. And this one is called Pride in My Ride. Now, this is the segment where you, the viewer, sends in a picture to me, John Clore, jclorecarsandcontext.com, and you tell me why you have pride in your ride. So this next Pride My Ride feature car is from someone we both know. Used to work at Auto Week with us. It comes from a guy named Dan Brockstein. Ah, oh, Dan. Dan okay. lives up in Birmingham. He has a wonderful old Cadillac that was once owned by his grandfather. This is a 1963 Cadillac sedan DeVille four door. Jim, look at that That's big beautiful. beauty. That is Detroit iron. And it's, look at the hood. So on Dan's this car. grandfather bought that car new. He bought it new. Wow. He, uh, he uh, Dan said that. He was a chain cigar smoker, and he burned the front seat so horribly that he had to go and buy a new seat for it, and they took forever to try to get the smoke out of the car. And But he still drives it. That You've seen this car in the Woodward Dream Cruise. 
Uh, they, they still drive it around. It's only got 60-some thousand miles wow. on it. How beautiful. Dan, thank you so much for that sending me in that wonderful picture of your grandfather's car that you're now taking care of. If you have pride in your ride, send it to me, jclore at carsandcontext.com, and we'll be sure to put it on here. But, Jim, that's not all. Yes. Really? We're going to ask Lauren Parrott here at WMTV. Lauren, is it possible that Cars in Context has some viewer mail that we can read on the air? You always have viewer mail. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lauren. You, Thank you. Oh, it looks beautiful. <laughs> we, Lauren Parrott brought us the latest, hottest viewer mail, and we're going to get right on it. Jim, why don't you take the first one? Thanks for sending me your letters. Okay. Folks. What's let this me, one? Let me see here. Okay. Uh, this one comes to us from John F. of Gross Point Farms. Okay. And he watches Cars in Context on Comcast Cable Channel 915. If it's 915, that means you're in HD. Oh, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Three digit, okay. <laughs> and he writes, Dear Cars in Context, why does the latest batch of small cars like the Fit, Yara, Spark, and Smart not get over 50 miles per gallon? I remember people telling me their old Geo Metro and Honda CRX <laughs> were getting 50 <laughs> miles per gallon back in the 80s. Yeah. How come we haven't seen much improvement in this area after 25 <laughs> years of question. new engine technology? It is a great question. Thank you, John. I'm going to leave right now and look for the answer. <laughs> no, wait a minute. You have to answer it. These cars that he named are uh, probably a lot heavier than the uh, the Metro or the Honda CRX. Honda CRX didn't have a back seat. Yeah, that's Tiny true. Tiny little car. Yeah, have those. It didn't have all that technology. All the airbags. It didn't all have airbags. air conditioning was standard. It didn't have roll up windows and rubber mats. Right, and right. So things. there's there's a lot that has been added, and a lot of structure has been added to cars because of safety standards. Okay. So they, so do they didn't crash more. as well. Right. So they're heavier. They're more expensive, and they when they're heavier, they, they right. carry. Right. A on. Honda CRX back in the day weighed about eighteen hundred pounds. See, John, there was a reason so. you thought it was. It's not that. So I have one. This comes from Rick F. and Harper Woods, who watches us on Comcast uh, nine fifteen. Another Comcast right here. He says, John, why does Consumer Reports beat up on American cars? You've been watching the show. They always beat. I don't know. It's been it's been a problem for them for a hundred years. But I got to tell you, Jim. This is the, this is, I'm glad you asked me this question because you know what? They've just recently stopped. If you read the recent uh, review they had, what was the, the Chevy Impala? The oh, the Impala, full-size sedans. Yeah. They are now saying that the Impala is uh, it's, it's, went, it's at the top of their list. It's a must-buy. They're impressed with its interior and handling. They said it's really a top pick. So maybe, I think the head of Consumer Report moved over to the Nissan. He may have had some uh, uh, alliances there. I don't know. All I can say is, Maybe there's hope for Consumer Reports yet, but don't count on it. If you want your real news, come to carsandcontext.com and come to Cars and Context here on WMTV for your real straight scoop. I really think that's the answer. So if you have a question that you want answered on the air by one of our experts, like Jim Sawyer of the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, send it to me, jclore at carsincontext.com, and we'll be sure to put your question on the air. You know, Jim, uh, when it comes to these kinds of things, it really takes a little bit more than just having an opinion. I think after all the years we spent uh, chasing cars in, the, in, in our journalism world and being enthusiasts and being involved in the industry, sometimes putting it into the context of our knowledge base really helps these people. And I, right. I really think today, kids, uh, you'll, you'll find, I hope, Jim, they find the joy of cars. We, it certainly has been something. To well, make. if not, there'll be more room on the road for us <laughs> to enjoy right. them. So. Right. Jim, again, thank you for coming by. Uh, we'll be sure to uh, have you on the show again to answer the burning questions of the day. Folks, I thank you for joining us on Cars and Context. Remember that knowledge is power. Amen. So, yeah, thank you. So until next time, I'm your host, John Clore, and thanks for watching.